So, <clears throat> excuse me, a few minutes. Uh, this is Saturday, and um, we're going to be doing the Atari 50th anniversary celebration. Um, I know there's a lot more um, in here than, you know, just standard games. Um, you know, there's little videos that we can watch and other documents that we can look at. So we're just going to jump right in and um, see what we can get into. <coughs> Sorry, I have a little cough today. All right. So have you played Atari today? So it says, welcome to Atari 50. Begin your interactive journey through Atari history below or jump straight into the game library at any time by pressing square. All right. <coughs> Birth of the console. Let's see. It says in 1977, Atari released the video computer system, changing the way we interacted with our TV sets and skyrocketing to massive success. So let's see. Arcade Origins. So it says from its earliest days, Atari experimented with a variety of different takes on innovative leisure, which are arcade games, music, visualization, and even holograms. So why don't we go ahead and just do this in the beginning? All right, in a world where pinball was King 2 engineers' dream that coin-operated games played on computers could become the next big thing. A company called Syzygy, I think is what it's called, was where it all started. <coughs> and then Computer Space. So, the first arcade game, Computer Space, was designed by Atari co-founders Ted Dabney and Nolan Bushnell and manufactured by Nutting Associates. It was based on the 1962 computer game Space War. Wow. All right. We're going to go down here. Finding the first computer space. In the year 2000, former Atari employee Jesse or Jerry Jessup saw a newspaper ad for a computer space machine in a Quonset hut on a sunflower seed farm. Okay. In California, he found the first computer space machine ever manufactured. Wow. Al Alcorn's business card. Dabney and Bushnell named the company Syzygy Engineering after a term from the direct alignment of the sun, the moon, and earth during an eclipse. Alan Alcorn, who had worked with Dabney and Bushnell at their previous workspace, was the first engineering hire at Syzygy, and this was his first card during those early days. So, that is interesting. That is interesting. All right. Atari, Inc., on June 27, 1972, Dabney and Bushnell incorporated their company in the state of California, but the name Syzygy was already taken. Okay. Instead, they chose Atari, a term from the Japanese game of Go. The company briefly continued doing business under the name Syzygy, however. All right, so... All right, Syzygy 1973. In rare footage from a 1973 documentary titled Games Computers Play... We hear from a young Nolan Bushnell inside the Syzygy offices. So, let's see. Notable. We're going to, we're actually going to watch that video here, but I want to look at other things. Notable and quotable. The genius of Atari was to create a fully formed commercial game that was designed for the masses and accessible to the masses. That's says Eugene Jarvis, creator of Defender. All right. More than just a game. We think of in Sunnyvale is a result of Atari. I think that ethos that ethos of creativity and openness that wasn't common back in the 70s and the 80s, and yet Atari pioneered that. So we hear that from Wade Rosen, current CEO of Atari. All right, well let's go ahead and watch this little clip. Well, I'd say 30 years to wow. pretty much the present. The arcades have been relegated to the back rooms and the side streets. And Boy, how far we have come, guys. An unsavory type of place. What we want to do is bring the amusement game to age. If we can give it a new zip and a pizzazz, it's going to be uh, financially right. successful as well as, I think, a very serious <clears throat> part in the leisure time activity of the American people. The marriage of traditional pinball machines and computer technology has resulted in the birth of a new breed of amusement games. And Nolan Bushnell is the man handing out the cigars. Bushnell has developed two such games, Computer Space and Pong, and believes that they and others like them will move the pinball industry out of America's bus stations and bowling alleys and into the space age. In 1971, Bushnell invented Computer Space, 
that sold production rights to Holy the moly. of Mountain View, California, for royalties based on the number of games sold. It proved a good deal for both parties. Sales already exceed 1,500 machines. Computer space like Pong sells for around $1,000 and is played on the screen of a standard television set, which has been programmed to display the desired game. In computer space, the player controls a rocket ship, which is trying to shoot down enemy flying saucers while avoiding their missiles. If the player scores more hits than the enemy saucers, he gets one free play. By the time Bushnell invented Pong in 1972, he was able to form his own company, Physigy Corporation in Santa Clara, California, to produce the game. He has already sold over a thousand machines and expects to sell 10,000 in the United States by the end of the year. Pong, as the name might indicate, is a game of video ping pong and volley with an equally electric. Oh ball. my gosh! It's in the early days of gaming. First player to score 15 points wins. While Bushnell did design and program both his games. The technology he uses dates back to the late 1950s. Thanks to research by the Defense Department in the wake of Sputnik, Bushnell is now able to act out as the nation inhabited by thousands of Pong and computer space games. Yours are a little uncomfortable. <laughs> on this technology, and as a result, now it's Whoops. Sorry. That we can put it into a game and sell it for 25 cents for uh, a few minutes. And, 25 uh, cents, and wow. A dollar at it. It's, a, um, it's something that the research and development really was, was done many years ago, and now it's cheap enough that uh, with PC boards and integrated circuits, we can use that technology to our advantage. The basic electronic unit of Bushnell's games is the integrated circuit. Each of these small chips is capable of storing large amounts of information. The program for a game is determined by specific combinations of these units to form a PC, or printed circuit board. The printed circuit board then tells the TV screen what to do. A single printed circuit board is all that is required to operate Pong, mm. whereas 15 years wow. ago it would have taken enough tubes and wiring to fill an average house. Mm. How, how far we've come, guys. ...potential of video games in a game called Space War, which has been played at computer centers around the country for... Now, I have years. heard a good deal about Space War. We used to play uh, Space War a lot at the AI project at Stanford, which uh, is a big, big computer complex. And um, one day it just hit, you know, this is a lot of fun. You ought to be able to package it and sell it for a price. And, you know, one thing leads to another, and pretty soon, from doodling on a scratch pad, you're actually working out some basic block diagrams, and from there you think, boy, you know, it's going to work. Huh. That was interesting. All right. So, we're going to look at Pong next. All right. So, while Pong was not the first arcade game, it was the first successful one, selling thousands more units than computer space and bringing in many more quarters. It is an exaggeration to say that this simple tennis game launched an entire industry. So, Birth of Pong, Al Alcorn, the creator of Pong, discusses the design process of this iconic game and how its signature sound effects came from a lack of resources, which I did hear about that. <clears throat> Alright, so we're gonna... Okay, it looks like these are all just pictures here. So we're gonna look at the pictures first and then we'll go to that video. Alright, Pong's original flyer still includes the name uh, Syzygy Engineering, but later materials accentuated the Atari name and Fuji logo. Okay. That is so strange, guys. Wow. My mom was a kid when this thing was going on. Good grief. Alright, Pong doubles. With other companies quickly looking to capitalize on Pong's success with clone machines, Atari looked to improve upon the experience. Pong doubles let four players get in on the fun. In this promotional photo are Joe Keenan, third from the left, Nolan Bushnell, fifth from the left, and Al Alcorn to the right. Huh. All right. And then Puppy Pong. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Since most coin-operated games were installed in bars and thus inaccessible to children, Atari developed Puppy Pong, a device meant to be installed in the waiting rooms of pediatric offices. The idea did not catch on, 
Oh, and Puppy Pong only had a small production run. Hmm. That is a cute cabinet, though. That almost kind of reminds me of Snoopy. Huh. And Dr. Pong. Interesting. Huh. That is cute, though. All right. So let's get to the Birth of Pong video. This should only take a few minutes. You know what the Atari motto Here's is? Here's Al Alcorn. Innovative leisure. Right? Well, it didn't say innovative arcade games. It didn't say innovative video games. It said innovative leisure. It was broad from day one. I mean, Nolan always had a consumer game in his mind because that's what he hired me to do. And I wound up doing the wrong thing and making a hit coin-op game, right? When I was at Ampex, I learned how to make sync generators, synchronizing the basic fundamental uh, uh, circuit necessary to get a TV signal because we had to <laughs> generate an analog signal. So you do that and you get the ball at one speed and you put paddles up and it's not, it's a very, very boring game. And uh, uh, so work I with what you had though, I mean. Up and I added the angles off of that just, you know, what to make it so playable, interesting. And, uh, and so I started getting a little interesting. That's cute. And Nolan said, well, it's got to have score. We had a pretty good game and hey, Great. So, what are you going to do for sound? He goes, Sound? I'm already over budget. Uh -huh. What am I going to do? Uh, uh, no one said, Well, I don't want the sound of a roar of a crowd of thousands applauding your win. And mm. Ted said, I want boos and hisses. And I'm thinking, How do I do that? Listen, I got video. I got the goddamn game up. Uh, now you wanted me to do this. I'll be right back. So, I pissed around for a day and poked around sounds that already existed in the vertical sync generator gated them out with the 555 timer. I love it. Years later, the sound is so well thought out, so appropriate. It was like, yeah. are you kidding me? It was just kind of is know, actually thrown together in, in spite of what the boss said. And so uh, that that was how that was how uh, Pong came to be. I mean, admittedly, he probably did you know, the best with what he had, because back in the early 70s, I mean, technology, you know, wasn't exactly what it is today, of course. So he had just had limited, minimal resources to work with. And, you know, sometimes that gives the best ideas when you don't have much to work with, because you really have to think it over. All right, Legend of the Broken Pong Machine. So looks like this is a video, too. Um, one of the often told stories of the origin of the video game industry is the tale of Al Alcorn being called by the manager of Andy Capps, the Sunnyvale bar where the first Pong prototype was on display to fix the broken machine. Alcorn and many other gaming industry legends recount the tale in this video feature. So let's see. Legend of the Broken Pong. So everybody's heard the Pong story. Probably everybody's heard the Pong story, but I've heard it many times, uh, and from Al Alcorn himself, who designed Pong, so. Uh, the story I've heard is that they installed <clears throat> one of the first Pong machines in a tavern and let people play it um, as a test. Put it out into an arcade and see if it makes money. I mean, that's, that's the market research. My understanding was Ted built a cabinet, uh, a, a tabletop, simple, simple cabinet uh, over the weekend. And uh, a coin mech bolted to the side of the cabinet, tabletop type of big thing was sit on a barrel. Placing a interactive video machine somewhere and having people play it was still a relatively new concept. Nobody knew if it was going to go. Oh, what is the name of the bar in Palo Alto? Uh -huh. San Jose? No, it was Andy Capps. Uh, it was Santa Clara. Sunnyvale. David Crane. So we, we'll put it in Andy Capps. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a coin op game, be it fragile and humble. Uh, and and so so we did. Well, my memory is that he gets a phone call, the game's busted, which of course is the usual thing you get on a support line. It doesn't work. What is it, and in what way does it not work? Well, it doesn't work. Yeah. The bar owner or manager at the time kind of yelled at them and, and like accused them of their game being shoddy because it had already broken down and it was no longer functioning or working. And they get a call, you know, later on that night and like, hey, this thing broke, you know. <laughs> Come and come and peek, pick up this piece of shit game and get it out of here. You know, this fucking thing broke. You know, I don't. I'm not going to waste my time fixing this crap. But anyway, the machine. We got the word that it stopped working, and I figured it could be anything. 
and I'd go out there and take a look at it. And uh, so I went to the, uh, went to the machine, uh, and the first thing you do is you want to try to play the game. Because the machine was on in a tracked mode, so there was, it was working, but you couldn't start a game. So you open up the coin, the coin box to basically flip the microscope oh, to give excuse yourself me. a free game, because I'm not going to waste a quarter, you know? And so mm -hmm. they went down to see what's wrong with the machine to fix it, and what they found out was that it wasn't broken. It was just that so many people had played it, they huh. filled the coin box with quarters. Oh, jeez. And, and they couldn't take any more. So many people had played it. That you could, that it couldn't accept any more money. The game is broken because it's stuffed so full of quarters. Completely stuffed with quarters. It, and it was a small. I remember it was kind of small. If I remember, it was a small space. It just filled up with the quarters, and it, it wouldn't take it. When I opened up the coin mac, you know, it's, all these quarters just gushed out. So, whoa, that's impressive. It's the equivalent of like crashing a server. When you launch ah. a new website, and it's so popular. So they crashed the server on Pong. And one of the other reasons That's it was hilarious. so popular is because you could play it with one hand while you're still holding a pint in your other hand. Um, and that also was one of those things that, you know, eventually many, many years later led to the rise of the fun barcades that we have, you know, and we can enjoy now. As Al will always say with a, with a little, you know, twinkle in his eye, he goes, this is a problem I can fix. <laughs> Basically, the way it worked was you take the money, the, the, the deal you have, and you split the take with the owner of the bar. And so I would, so I did that, and I had this sack of quarters, and the next day I come into work, and I said, oh, I got the machine fixed, and here's the problem, this goddamn thing's making too much money. And no one, really? But it was, it was one of those yeah. great moments where something that uh, supposedly was failing was, was actually such a huge success that no one could recognize. It was truly the ugly duckling version of technology. Because remember, no one thought, mm -hmm. I'm, he was like, this is just a placeholder until we get to design the really good game, because who's going to play this stupid shit-ass game? They went on to produce all of these classic, memorable arcade titles for years that allowed the company to survive and, and be so much more than a one-hit wonder. So that's my understanding of the history of Pong. It's a great story, huh? if it's true. Ah. <laughs> I guess they don't if believe him. If it's good, you know there's some doubt about it. Like, well, that's too good to be really true. It's probably a boring version of it. That's actually true. Uh, you know, I, 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 it sounds, it sounds realistic to me, you know, I mean, uh, I've, you know, I've kind of seen that happen in my own and, and when you do get a really great game, the coins will just overflow and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a cool feeling. <laughs> anyway, that's how that all happened. Yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> that's interesting. Let's see, I'm just gonna. All right, so we got Space Race from Atari, for Atari's second game, it went back to the Space Challenger. Space Race challenged two players to get their spaceship to the top of the screen first while dodging an asteroid field. Although Space Games would eventually be some of the top earners at the arcade, Space Race was not a success, unfortunately. Okay. Let's a quick look at that. Gotcha. <laughs> I've heard of this one. Um, Atari's fourth game was a simple maze game in which one player attempted to catch the other. What made Gotcha controversial was the pink domes covering the joysticks, which were meant to resemble breasts. The game's risque flyer extended the metaphor. Ultimately, the domes were removed from the machines because of cost concerns. Hmm. Touch Me. An Atari coin-operated machine called Touch Me was not a video game, an electronic device that challenged a player to repeat an ever lengthening pattern of button presses. Ralph Baer, the inventor of home gaming consoles, saw a Touch Me machine and was inspired to improve on it to create the iconic head held game Simon. So that's where that came from. Key games. While Atari was quite successful in 1973, it felt it was being held back by the fact that coin operated machine distributors wanted exclusive. A separate company headed up by Joe Keenan that would sell similar machines to other distributors. Key's game Illumination was released by Atari as Quadrapong, for example. So let's see down here. So we're going to look at Tank. All right, so looks like just some images here. 
Uh, this military combat game was the only title produced by Key Games that was not a clone of an Atari product. Shortly after its release, Atari formally acquired Key, bringing an end to the fiction that they were competitive rivals. However, the Key Games division continued an operation until its, under its own name until 1978. The first new entry in the tank series since 1978, Quadra Tank, is a four-player twist on the classic tank combat gameplay. Developed in 2022 by Digital Eclipse, it combines features from all the tank games, even letting you play like this. So, why don't we just hop right in and give it a try? All right, to celebrate Atari's 50th anniversary, Digital Eclipse has returned to the origin of combat with this four-player reimagining of tank. Players, as individuals or teams, have a choice of weapons, arenas, terrain, and game modes, including capture the flag. All right. So let's see. I have no idea what I'm doing, but let's see. All right, except... All right. All right, how in the world do you move? I wonder. Oh, okay. Never mind. Yep, it released already. It actually released uh, yesterday fr on Friday. Okay. Still trying to figure out how the heck I control this thing here, because... Okay. 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 Sorry guys, I'm like legit cannot figure out these controls. Um now that's not gonna tell me. Oh, oh, you know what? Here's the instruction manual. Okay. Quadra track or quadra tank. Okay. An analog game controller. Okay, so forward, I have to, looks like, okay, left turn. Why well, they cannot make these easy, can they? Okay. Speed. Okay. Okay, I think I'm getting it now. Hopefully. I just don't have anyone here to actually play with, so... Probably be a lot more fun if, uh, like my husband or somebody was in here playing this with me, but. But th this is pretty, this is pretty interesting. Okay, what's this R? Alright, it's not letting me grab the R. Yeah, we probably just have to kind of hang around until the till the timer runs out. Range. Right now, I'm just trying to destroy all these boxes. Oh gosh. Yeah, like I said guys, sorry, I have, I have like the I have like the foggiest idea of what I'm doing here, so I'm just instead of uh 
just would be nice. It probably would have been a lot more fun if there was not just me on the field here, because I don't really have anyone to shoot. So, but just trying to figure this out, I guess. And of course, my uh, image is blocking the little corner there. Oh well. Okay, looks like we got one minute on the timer. So, okay, come on. Oh. Okay. Hmm. All right, so we got that. Got 20 seconds on the timer, guys. Okay. Health. Health, alright. Time up. Alrighty. So we're just gonna head to the main menu. Alright, so we'll go ahead and quit this one. Get back into the... Alright, from transistors to CPUs. Early arcade games like Tank and Pong were not software programs. Instead, they were built purely out of custom computer hardware mounted on massive motherboards. A 1975 release of the incredibly affordable MOS 6502 processor meant that Atari and others could now program their games in software. Interesting. Alright, this is the Home Pong version, which I've actually seen these before. Uh, let's see. Although Magnavox Odyssey, designed by Ralph Baer, had already come out in 1972, the home video game craze truly kicked off with the wildly successful home version of Pong, released as shown here by the retailer Sears as Telegames Pong for the 1975 Christmas season. All right. <clears throat> All right, Atari Pinball. Atari launched the pinball division in 1975 with the aim of innovating on the still popular game. Atari built more expensive machines with advanced computer hardware and larger play fields, but the new technology was not reliable. Atari quickly left the pinball business, but not before producing some interesting tables. All right, so let's see, we got... I'm just looking here real quick, guys. Looks like we got a video and some images, so we're just going to look at the images first. All right, the Atarians. Atari entered the pinball market in 1977 with the Atarians, which featured a wide boy play field that was 27 inches wide compared to a standard machine's approximate 20 inch width. It was also an extreme, an, an early example rather, of a pinball game controlled by a computer processor versus simply being built out of electromechanical parts. Very interesting. Very cool. That, that actually looks pretty cool. Huh. Definitely, I definitely wouldn't mind honestly having like a pinball machine in my game room. That would be pretty cool. Uh, let's see, Time 2000. The first pinball machine for which Jarvis did the programming was Time 2000. Like the Atarians, it featured a wide boy play field for more scoring opportunities and more ball action. In keeping with the time theme, it featured two clocks in the play field that advanced bonus counters. When it was designed by Marty Rosenthal. Okay. So let's take a quick look here. That looks pretty yeah, that looks pretty neat. Okay. Alright, Airborne Avenger, the first pinball game designed by Steve Ritchie, who went on to create fame machines like Black Knight and High Speed, and who still design pinballs to this day. Okay. That's pretty cool. Oh, I really like this one. That looks neat. Alright. And then we have Hercules, it's seven feet tall, eight feet deep, and over three feet wide. Atari's Hercules is the biggest commercial pinball machine ever manufactured. Instead of standard silver pinballs that used pull cue balls, ultimately, once players got past the novelty factor, Hercules was not much fun. It was the last pinball machine Atari ever produced. Hmm. Okay. 
So we're going to look. Okay, yep, we can play Breakout. So we're definitely going to play some Breakout. All right. Famously designed by Apple founder Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, Breakout was essentially a single-player Pong in which the player had to continually deflect a bouncing ball back up to the top of the screen to break rows of bricks. It was a smashing success, no pun intended. Uh, I wonder if they did intend a pun like that. Including in Japan, where it inspired the later creation of Space Invaders by Taito. Very cool. So, yes, I do love me some Breakout. So, we're going to go ahead and play this guys all right so how do you how do you start this i wonder okay player oh okay player one and then how the heck okay let's let's reset this all right player one insert coin nope i need what i want okay there we go And then you, okay. Okay, there we go. Oh, whoops. Okay, well, that didn't last very long. Okay. Well, for crying out loud, guys. Okay. Apparently, I suck at breakout on this. Which is funny, because I have breakout on the Atari 2600. And I'm fantastic at it, but then again, the uh, controls are made for it, honestly. But so, so try play around with this for a couple minutes here, and then move on. Just how this? What I can't believe, guys, is just how far we've come. In the gaming industry, like, ah, you know what? I'm tired of it. Let's go ahead and move on here. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to move on to a clash of cultures. In November 1976, Warner Communications acquired Atari for $26 million, about $130 million in 2022. Atari's main reason for staking a buyer was that it needed funding to produce its first video game console with interchangeable cartridges, which is known as the Atari VCS. But the marriage of Atari's freewheeling, freewheeling spirit and Warner's corporate culture would prove to be an uneasy one. Why Warner wanted Atari? Warner Communications, for its part, was eager to expand its entertainment holdings, seeking video games as an entertainment industry with growth potential. After buying Atari, quickly became, it quickly began investing more money in, into it to grow the business. There's Ray Kassar. A Harvard Business School graduate, Ray Kassar enjoyed a successful career in textiles before Warner installed him as president and CEO of Atari in 1978. Kassar led the company through its most intense periods of rapid growth and enormous profit, as well as its most dramatic financial losses. All right. So as Warner kicked in, Ray Kassar had marketing that knew nothing about games. They didn't play games. Marketing told engineering what to do and basically turned it into a stodgy old Calcified Filthy Rich Company. And that quote came from Al Alcorn himself. In came Ray Kassar, and now there was a new mindset. The new mindset is we got, we've got, we got a cash cow. We've got to milk the crap out of it. it. came from Howard Scott Warshaw, designer of Yara's Revenge. I don't think Ray ever really understood the value of the engineering talent that he had. Lindy Allen, designer of Lunar Lander. Hmm. Fateful shirt. Relation between Atari's designers and management at Warner did not improve when executive Ray Kassar called the designers a bunch of high-strung prima donnas. In a newspaper interview, oh yeah, in a newspaper interview, in response, the designers printed these shirts, which read "Just another high-strung prima donna at Atari," and wore them to work. That's funny. All right, there were a fair number of people miffed at that high-strung prima donna thing. And Carlina, who was one of the graphic artists in the publications group, we just thought a little and said that would make a great t-shirt. Hmm. All right. So, did they do drugs at Atari? Okay, I've heard of this one. One of the often heard stories about Atari game designs is that drugs were often involved. They put the question directly to the designers who were there and found that everyone's experience was quite different. So let's see what goes on here. 
you will hear stories of hot tubs in the lobby and drug use in the office. And I'm here to tell you that none of that happened in my department. We <laughs> started smoking pot right in our office. Rob and I were like the premier pot. No, sorry, Rob. Um, I and some other person who occasionally shared an <laughs> office with me for five years at Atari, however that freaking worked, we would just fire up right in the office. It's like, who knows why? It's like, oh, geez. It's, like it's illegal. It's mm. like, it wasn't even a sense of privilege. It was just mindlessness. I oh, worked geez. in a satellite office. I started in 1977, which was still pretty early. It was only 18 months since the 2600 came out. Uh, but there were there was no hot tub in the lobby of the office that I went to. There was no drug use in Atari, though I don't doubt that it was over where Howard and Todd Fry were working. Uh, drugs were consumed at Atari by all kinds of people at all levels of management from the bottom to the top and all over engineering. Not everybody did drugs, and, but uh, some people did and some people enjoyed them and some people abused them and mm. some people went to the hospital on them. And, uh, but by and large, drugs were a relatively nominal uh, factor. Uh, drugs, you know, there was a lot of marijuana and it would participated a lot in brainstorming. So we had the way of, you know, trying to incorporate drugs into our productivity. Oh, jeez. I went home and I smoked a joint, a little bit of cocaine and a little bit of psilocybin in it. And I was sitting there, it was about half gone when I realized, oh, you could do that. And it's like, I put it out and I went and I wrote a page of notes and my design for that kernel was exactly what it ended up ended up shipping. It was like it has a tremendous amount of effort actually to get everything organized. You know, they they did have good deliveries of cannabis in the inter office mail. You know, that was that was probably the primary use of those those yellow Manila envelopes. Um, so that, I think it was you know Fridays or Monday. I think it was Fridays when the you get these really thick envelopes coming through the system. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there, and there was weird. There was like there was a guy working there. Mm. His his job was he was the weed dealer. You know, oh boy! Was, he didn't really. That was his sole job at the whole company. And there was a very straight German VP of hardware down the hallway in the building. I have no idea. Um, and um, he complained to management about the smell of pot smoke in the corridors. So they got him an office in a different building. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! I. I have been asthmatic since I've been 12. I, I need drugs to, to, to breathe. I did not do drugs, because drugs to me were something that let you get up in the morning, you know, and breathe. So I, and, and nor did I think I wanted to mix those things. I, I, the high of me was doing the work, and I was always a happy guy, so I just didn't need, I just didn't feel I needed it. So I never did drugs, but there were a lot there. Don't put too much stock in the fact that every Atari employee was stoned out of their minds while making games. Yeah. I mean, there was all kinds of drugs consumed at Atari, but the, the real drug at Atari was going into a store and seeing your product, seeing your game on a shelf. Mm -hmm. All right. Got Sprint 8, an A-player driving game. Sprint 8 was a massive cabinet that featured eight steering wheels and eight seats of gas eight sets of gas and brake pedals arranged around a monitor that pointed upwards allowing eight friends or enemies to race simultaneously all right well let's give this a try okay so how do we How do you, whoops, no. That ain't what I want here, okay. Okay, how the heck do you, okay, there we go. Okay, well, apparently I'm not gonna figure this one out either. Okay.
Okay, we're just gonna do it. Whoa, whoa, okay. Hello. Yeah, I, uh, I love racing games, guys, but I, I suck at this one, too, so. Oh, yeah, I just went through a wall. So there's that. Okay. <laughs> oh, Lord, this is terrible. This is, whoa, this is terrible. Okay. Right now, I'm using the uh, directional buttons on my PS5 controller. Really? Ah. I'm just pressing random buttons at the moment, so. Huh. Okay. Guess that is done. Okay. Alright, so we'll put that one. Atari Video Music. Okay, I haven't heard of this one. The first electronic music visualizer ever sold commercially. Atari Video Music could be hooked up to a user stereo system and television set. To display psychedelic visuals, reminiscent of Atari's VCS graphics, to the rhythm rhythms of whatever music was playing. A variety of knobs and buttons on the front of the device let users adjust the images. Huh. Got fire truck. I'm just gonna look here. Super breakout. Alright, so it looks like we can play play these. Um <clears throat> so fire truck is said based on it on designer Wendy Allen's previous game, Superbug. Fire Truck is a unique two-player cooperative game in which one player sitting at the cabinet steers with the front half of the truck while the other player standing behind the seated player swings the rear half. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to play this. I might not be able to play this. Um, maybe. I've, I've heard of this game. Yeah, I... I... Okay. I say again, guys, how far we have come in the world of video games. And I'm running out of fuel. The heck was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. This is like a really... This is bizarre... Oh, oh, okay. That looks like a car. I thought, I thought, I thought those were frogs at first. Okay. Ay, ay, ay. Oil. No, 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 no. Oh, goodness. Okay. Okay, then. Okay, we got it. What? Nope. Follow the arrows. I'll tell you one thing. If there was an actual fire, the poor people. I just, I don't know. I would not be able to save them. I'm running out of fuel. My fire truck's probably just in shambles. Okay. Go around this way. Crunch. Another crunch. Yep, 
Yep, I lost my lost my fuel. Alrighty. So we're gonna do a super breakout. So the update to the original game designed by N. Rotberg. Super Breakout was billed as three games on one. A switch on the front of the unit let the player choose between three different game variations. It still had a black and white display with colored added via plastic overlays on the monitor. Alright, so L1 credit. R2 game select. Hmm. All right, how the heck do you, okay. And of course, I'm going to lose these again. Oh, 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 darn it. Okay. I don't know how the heck they expect you to get the ball here when it's on like the complete opposite side of the screen from the other ball. Okay, come on, where's my... Oh, change the game. Alrighty. Let's try this one. Really? There we go. And I just gave myself more credits here. Ah. All right, let's see. I'm just not good at breakout on here for some reason. All right, so we got Lunar Lander, vector displays where you new technology that allow games to draw crisp, Clean, high-resolution lines. Lunar Lander, designed by Wendy Allen and Rich Moore, was Atari's first vector game. In sharp contrast to other fast-paced arcade games, Lunar Lander was a deliberate, methodical game in which the player had to carefully land a space capsule on the surface of the moon. Interesting. There's your promotional flyer. I'm just going to kind of zoom through these. Vector Sector. Okay, we, we are going to excuse me, get to that one. I just wanted to look around at some of these here. So we got Superbug and Fire Chuck for the promotional flyers. Okay. There's supposed to be one on here called Neo Breakout. So that might come a little bit later. Okay. Okay, so I am supposed to... Okay, I'm guessing I am that... Yeah, I'm that little... A little dot there that looks like a very tiny octopus. So, wonder... Uh... Hmm. Okay, I see how we're supposed to do it here. Um, all right. Uh, hmm. All right, so let's see. So let's see what Vector Sector is like. So the digital eclipse tribute to just Atari's distinctive vector 
graphics arcade games, Vector Sector takes inspiration from Asteroids, Lunar Lander, Tempest, and more in a remix twin stick shooter that honors Atari's arcade legacy on its 50th anniversary. Alright, let's see. Vector Sector. Let's see. All right, so this will be kind of like a asteroids. Okay, now I know I'm good at asteroids, so that this is more at my alley here. Whoops! So much for that. <laughs> Well, I was good at asteroids. Alright, we got wave one. Oh! I guess you have... Huh. Interesting. How the heck do you... See. Touch me. Okay. After the success of being handheld game Simon, which took inspiration from, uh, from Atari's 1974 arcade game Touch Me, Atari released a handheld version of Touch Me that, in turn, took inspiration from Simon. Atari planned to release more handheld games, but this was the only one that shipped. In this collection, you can play a recreated version of the main gameplay mode of handheld Touch Me. Okay. Super Breakout handheld. Okay. I didn't know there was such a thing as that. <coughs> hmm. That is interesting. Alright, we'll we'll give this a go. Okay, let's see. Touch me. So I just have to follow the pattern. Ah, uh, ah, uh, darn it. Missed that one. All right, let's move on. So we got asteroids. This is the original asteroids. wonder how far we got to go on here. Okay. All right. Sorry, guys. So we got asteroids. I'm just going to kind of hurry through here a little bit more so we can look at other things. So I got asteroids, said you got three ways to play. Okay. Alright, so let's go ahead and play some couple 
a minute or two of asteroids. Apparently suck at playing games on this thing, so. Oh. Alrighty. So we're gonna equip that. So we got missile command, so we can play some missile command. Then they also got the promotional flyer and some a couple t-shirt art. Okay, pretty cool. All right, so we're going to play this one. Just a minute or two of that. Now, I've never played Missile Command, so I think you just have to... Oh, wait, what'd I do? Oh, I'm limited on... A... Uh... Yep, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Ah. Alright. So, okay, let's see. We got Cosmos Holographic. Oh! In January 1981, Atari announced that it would release Cosmos, a handheld gaming system in which each game would be displayed atop a custom hologram image. Huh. The game graphics were made up of simple LED lights, but the holograms provided a dynamic, realistic backdrop. Atari never released it. Okay. So, it looks like we got a video here. So we're going to watch this real quick. When was this? 1980, 81, that time frame. Prior to Ray Kassar's emergence, I was part of the executive staff, you know, and Nolan, Joe, I, Steve Bristow, Gil, uh, Dennis Groth, fi finance, you know. We were all friends and no politics and all that, and we all worked together and, and uh, part of the team. It set, it was, it was great. Once Ray took over, nope, it was all mm. a closed office, and he had his, he met with all his hires from Procter and Gamble, and so I realized, okay, I'm out of this. I'm either going to oh, have geez. to quit because Nolan had gone, Joe had gone, uh, Lipkin, everybody had gone. Uh, I figured, well, I'll go back. This is my baby. I'm going to do it one more time. And I, we had used holography. We had, we couldn't keep secrets at Atari. We were uh -oh. good at it. So, so uh, we decided the best thing to do was put out disinformation. So the, the one of the best ones was the well, next coin op game is going to have holography in it. Was like, what the hell is that? I knew what it was because having, you know, been to college and studied this physics and stuff. But that was just, but then anyway, I decided, well, I'll do something, let's do something in holography. Maybe there's something there. I'll take it. Sounds like, sounds hard. Sounds interesting. I know a little bit about yeah. it. And uh, we proceeded to explore holography and what could be done and uh, came up with a, with a holographic toy that basically sold it to Ray saying, how would you like, because the cartridge. That does look like pretty nice. Is very good. Mm. How would you like to have a system where. The cartridge, it's a cartridge-based system, but the cartridges are half the cost of, everything is half the cost of the VCS. And hey, go ahead. It were very simple. They were nothing more than a, an LED, uh, a, a simple LED game, a handheld LED game in those days. The only difference was we had a hologram with two images on it. You look through this box and there were two lamps inside and, and when you'd crash a spaceship, you'd see a hologram of a 
spaceship craft. That that, that does and, look uh, that does look neat. Through this half metalized mylar huh. and and play a, a space invader game or something like that. Hmm. We did all the work, put everything together, got a chip designed, package designed, and and at the end Ray wouldn't. We even took it to the toy fair uh, or the consumer. We and, and marketing wouldn't show it, wouldn't back it up. Mm. We did it ourselves, engineering, and we sold. We think we sold a hundred thousand of them, but Ray wouldn't, would not release it. Just wouldn't do it. And I realized that was it. Uh, they're not going to release that. I mean, this is now in a time when if it failed, you wouldn't even notice it. It wouldn't be a pimple on the balance sheet. Uh, but they were afraid to do it back when it would. The whole company was we sure we'd do it. So that was m end of my. Oh, jeez. America, the giant arcade, no longer novelties regulated by the back of pinball parlors. Coin operated video games became ubiquitous in the early 1980s. Games can now be found not only in dozens of dedicated arcades, but also in bowling alleys, restaurants, laundromats, supermarkets, practically anywhere people might be found with quarters in their pockets and a little time on their hands. At Asteroids Deluxe, find the smash success of Asteroids, this deluxe version. Of the game designed by David Shepard introduced several new features to challenge players who had mastered the original game. A shield instead of a hyperspace jump, new enemy types, and a higher difficulty level overall. Oh boy. Oh. We gotta see some images there. Uh, let's give this a shot here for a minute or two. It looks, uh, nifty. I had no idea this was a thing. Oh, there's a UFO! Ha! Gotcha. Ah, uh, got me. Darn it. UFOs are, UFOs are out to get me. All right. Got warlords. And centipede. Yep, so okay, so here's a lot of uh, games we can play here. Holy moly, there's a lot. Alright. Alright, let's scroll back. Yeah, we're gonna look at the game library here. Okay, so we stopped at Asteroids Deluxe. Okay, so let's see Black Widow. Okay, so these are all. Okay, all right, yeah, so here's all the, you know what, guys, we're gonna probably take a break from that. We're gonna just look at these games here and see what we have going on, because I am going to have to end the stream here shortly, so, but I definitely want to stream this again, because th this has been pretty fun. So we're gonna look at these Atari Reimagined games, all right. So we got Haunted Houses, a 2600 game that established the survival horror genre. That's interesting. Didn't know that little tidbit of info. Has been reanimated into in 3D in honor of Atari's 50th anniversary. Two players can explore multiple environments together, armed with new gadgets to assist in finding the shattered pieces of a funeral urn. Okay. Oh, hi. My name's Ernie. Say, you seem to be pretty limber for a floating pair of eyeballs. Must be nice. All right, so we gotta press the L stick to try moving around. Ha! Nice, you did it. Do you also think you can use R to look around? Okay. It doesn't seem like it's a little dark in here, even for fun of school. I mean, press square and light that torch. Okay. <coughs> The bar in the upper left will tell you when your torch is set to expire. When enough's a snuff, 
Press square to fire back up. All right. I'm scared about. Okay. Oh, let's see. There's a the little item. Okay. Wood and grabbed. Okay, I already grabbed that. Carry one item at once. Pressing answer to drop the item that you're carrying. Okay. Wait, but your progress so far is inspiring. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Hold R2 while pressing L to run. Try running to the ship ahead. Okay. Okay. I might be a jar, but the store is not a jar. In fact, the store is locked. Use those giant peepers and look around for the skeleton key. All right. Oh, there's the key. I gotta grab it. It's me or a piece of me. Okay. Let's get ahead. Let this elevator let you stress the next floor. Okay. Okay, so this is a dead end. Alrighty. Ghost. Okay. <laughs> that looks like an arcade cabinet. There's the other piece. <laughs> whoa, whoa! He got me. a piece Let me 
Exit. Okay, yep, that's the missing piece. I thought I had missed a piece. Gotta look around this. There we go. Okay, so you gotta unlock some of these. Okay. Alright. Alright, guys. So we're gonna try out... We're gonna do Neo Breakout. Actually... Yeah, we'll go ahead and do Neo Breakout, and then I am gonna have to call it quits right now, but I definitely want to stream this some more, because this has been fun. Actually, yeah, let's go ahead and reset. Alright, let's do Battle Breakout. Alright, that's a little better. Aw, oh, man. Ah. Uh, okay. Well, you know what? I'm curious about Yara's Revenge Enhance, so let's give this a try. goodness. Alright guys, well I'm gonna call it quits here for right now, but I've enjoyed this. 
Like, I really did have a lot of fun with this today, so hopefully you guys did too. You guys stay safe. Always remember that Jesus loves you. I love you guys too. Have a great day.